Welcome to the third section of the course. In the previous section, we got familiar with different kinds of Java microservice frameworks and took a look at why we picked the frameworks we picked for the course. We then began setting up our development environment and created our first microservice, Customers, using Payara Micro. We got familiar with JIXRS and CDI and implemented the microservice that will manage our application's customers. In this section, we will begin by taking a look at how to decompose an existing monolith application into microservices and reviewing why stateless microservices are crucial to the architecture. We'll continue with finishing our customer's microservice by replacing JDBC database access with GPA and thus creating a base project structure for building microservices, which we will follow with the other two. We will build the second order's microservice using DropWizard, learn how to monitor it, integrate it with other microservices and monoliths, implement integrated SSO security, and create automatic tests for it. This is the first video of the third section, decomposing an existing monolith application into microservices. In this video, we will take a look at how to begin decomposing and splitting an existing monolith application into microservices. In the last video of the first section of the course, we talked about how to go about breaking the monolith into microservices. We described various strategies, stuff to watch out for, and other tips and tricks. To recap what we said, when you divide, you should work around single independent business capabilities and not by technical merit. Try and isolate the component with the least connections and dependencies, ideally none, and start to separate there. We'll see how we did this with the customer's microservice. Avoid EGB remote or similar binary calls. Make sure you expose what you need via HTTP using REST or SOAP. Although we won't have any timers or schedules in our example, you should be mindful of them and try to externalize them if at all possible. Any UI you have should be separated either into its own microservice if it's server side or host the static files somewhere else if it's a single page application. And again, make reusable services everywhere for everything. Let's return to our e-commerce microservice architectural design. We broke the monolith into five distinct pieces. Customers, products, orders, payments, and UI. Let's take a more detailed look at the rationale here. The most common flow we want to address and the one we are working now on to create is to place and complete an order. We will do so by creating an order at the orders microservice, which will, before placing it, verify the customer by calling the customer's microservice and verify the items in it by calling the products functionality, which we will in our example remain running in our existing monolith application. We already began creating and almost finished the customer's microservice. In this section, we will build the orders microservice and then follow it up with the payment microservice in the fourth section. Let's explore how we came to this design by looking at the common monolithic design of such an application. A design like that will contain everything in a single project. Let's go through what we will usually find. We might have a ski module, which will contain our data model, typically written in the form of XML schema files, like you can see here. We may have messages and common types split up into separate files. Inside our main type definitions file, we can find all the relevant types, such as the transaction, supplier, product, order type, and so on. This will then be transformed into Java objects and look something like this. The data model is then used by the web application, which is typically present in a separate module. If the monolithic application is built based on a more layered architecture, like SOA, the business logic will be contained in a separate services module using AGBs. If not, we might have more work to do to expose all the required functionality. As you can see, we typically have local and remote interfaces with their implementations. In the products interface, we will mostly focus on the single operation we will need, retrieve product. If we take a look at the implementation, the data is retrieved from the database using GPA. The latter forms another layer and is present in another module, as you can see here. Everything is then packaged together into a single EAR and deployed on an application server. Now that we have a good understanding of the simplified structure of our e-commerce monolith, we can begin to identify how we can split it up. Customer's information is something that we can immediately identify as being separate. 
as the application didn't have any specific functionality about it. Transactions is another one which can not only be separate, but also potentially used by other applications in our organization. Last two sections we can identify are products and orders. This can be considered a tightly coupled functionality and keeping them together is a good idea. Our migration, however, will be done step by step. First, we'll migrate the orders part and keep the products part here. Later on, we could complete the entire migration. Therefore, you will need access to the product functionality. The EGBs will not be particularly easy to access from the outside, so we will expose them with SOAP web services, if they are not already, as their design more aligns itself with them instead of REST. A simple SOAP interface that forwards all calls to the EGBs will in most cases suffice, like you can see here. We will integrate our orders microservice with the SOAP service in the following videos. One last thing, when splitting up data models, be careful to replace references to objects which will not be the responsibility of the microservice, like the order object, which contains the customer and the transaction with basic IDs, as otherwise we would still need to maintain a single monolithic data model repository.